The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Welcome back to DIS1. Um, and we will start uh, with a quick review from what we did last week. This was um, visual design, right? So um, anybody remember the four principles of visual design? Yes, they had a nice acronym too. Yeah, the CRAFT acronym. Um, so contrast, repetition, um, alignment, and proximity. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Or the park ones, which will make more sense to you once we've seen the history section. Um, all right, so uh, we talked about those four. Uh, then you saw um, we had a little bit of, of uh, topic about color. And um, if you are asked to create contrast using color, what's a, what's a good model, a good approach you can take to find contrasting colors? Yes, uh, all the way back there. You mean the color, sir? Yeah, color, sir, yeah, yeah. So that was what you were gonna say too, right? You guys were in the same line of sight here, sorry. Uh, yes, there's a uh, color circle. So you can go ahead and uh, use things like, you know, um, colors that are on the opposite side of the wheel or maybe, you know, uh, three colors that are distributed um, in, in an equal distance from each other. Um, there were a couple of variants on that. Uh, next up, we talked about fonts too, right? I mean, color, fonts, these are all essential parts of building user interfaces, right? They are still mostly visual, so uh, knowing these things really uh, helps you build good UIs. So what kind of font types did we, uh, did we distinguish? Anybody remember? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, modern, sanseric, cluster, decorative, mm -hmm. street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the original one, yeah. Old style, yeah. Old school is. I like that too. Uh, old style, yes, exactly. Uh, so those were, you know, old style is the one that really looks like, you know, it's from a from a book that's 100 years old. Um, and then we went through these others. And uh, when would you typically use? Uh, serif styles. You remember serifs, like the little feet on on each letter. Um, when would that typically get used? What part of a of a text layout, for example, of a page layout, would you typically use serif? Yeah. Have you guys? Say if you mean like the. Thin ones, or like in comparison to the body of the letter itself, or not thin, or curvy, or like not curvy, or something. Or well, well, serif uh, serif types are a bunch of different ones, right? They're all the ones that have um, that basically have these little resting feet at the end of their um, of their lines, right? And th this also can creates this sort of almost. Like it almost like it's, it's like a dotted line uh, on where the letters are resting on the ground line where you're writing on, um, and because of that, you know, you, what do you think? Um, I think serif types are better to read. So mm -hmm. you use them for long text. Exactly, right. So serif types are actually easier to read because the eye gets guided. It's almost like you get a line to follow along. They're a little easier to read than sans serif, like most of the modern fonts, um, um, or you know, the ones that are called sans serif, not, not modern, but sans serif fonts, are a little harder to read. And even though RWH has this, for example, you know, has this official policy, everything is being written in sans serif, from a purely psychological, like you know, reading quality point of view, uh, the ones that do have serifs are actually a little easier uh, to read. Um, and uh, last up, let's say you're you're laying out a UI. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering why do we have like sense here on slide? Uh, oh, oh, why why do we have that? Uh, because I like to really bother you with badly. No, no. Uh, the point is, what you're getting here is not what I would consider long body text, right? I'm talking about like a paragraph of text, for example. So when your eye starts, you know, maybe getting a, getting lost from one line to the next, this kind of stuff, that length and that mass of uh, text is what where you typically use, uh, you know, you should consider using serif types. Is it uh, different between like reading on the screen or 
and on the paper. Oh, welcome to a 40-year-old discussion that people still haven't quite figured out. But um, today, with the resolution that you t get today from, like, you know, retina-style displays or whatever you want to call them, high-resolution DPI uh, displays, and the contrast that we're now getting, and especially with things like OLED and which, like, black is actually fully black, um, there's no distinguishing difference. We actually, there was a paper a couple of years ago that claimed there was a difference in like, you know, cognition processes and we redid the experiments that they did. They were Harvard folks and we found that it's actually not true. So um, it's, there's not really a difference today whether you're reading on paper or on digital if the physiological parameters are roughly the same. I mean, of course, if you're reading on a pixely screen with like low contrast, then you will have a harder time reading, but that would be the same if you printed out that picture on like gray paper with like pixely fonts, right? So it's really more a question of uh, resolution and, and contrast. And um, we talk about this a little bit more in DIS2, but if you really uh, look at the uh, resolution of your eye, uh, what your eye can actually dissolve. There is a certain maximum sort of, you know, pixel density that you could say makes sense in a UI. And once you are at that level or above, uh, it's actually for the eye, not really a difference. I mean, there's still differences between people, right? Uh, whether your eyesight is really, really good. Um, but uh, based on distance, you get certain um, resolutions. Uh, they're roughly on that order where Apple calls them retina resolutions because they, they did the same calculation, right? They said, okay, what resolution do we need so that the eye is the limiting factor and no longer the display? And it's, of course, it's bigger pixels if you're farther away, right? Because um, that uh, resolution is measured in the angle. Um, all right, so related to that, maximum text line width. So how long, now if we do have that body text that we just talked about, like so a whole paragraph of text or a whole page of text, uh, and you're laying that out, um, how long should you make text at maximum so that people don't get lost from one line to the next, yeah? 60 characters? 60, 60, 60, yeah. Uh, that's right, uh, 60 characters, that's not a lot. Uh, do a count on your typical like one column, you know, like essay layout, and you'll probably find that you're already above that. So do consider uh, if it's possible from the formatting, you know, rules that you may have um, where you're handing this in, whether you go for a two column layout. That's why a lot of magazines and, and journals and stuff do this two column layout. It's just easier for the eye once you've reached the end of one line to actually make it back to the beginning of the next, right? And that's the same thing where serif fonts also are helping. Okay, uh, so that's a quick review of the visual design stuff. Uh, please, I know this was a video lecture last week, but do go and, and watch that in detail and, and check it out. It's really not just for DIS1, but this will also help you design you know, amazing posters, amazing uh, you know, uh, term papers that you need to do, amazing res resumes when you, hire, when you apply for a job. Uh, so it's, it's universal, like we're communicating through visual media, right? That's what we're doing all the time. And, and you'll learn really important layout uh, tips when you, when you look at that. All right, um, now, um, before we start uh, with our history le le uh, lesson, I want to show you a pretty cool new interface. Uh, Casio released this. This is a smartwatch uh, that actually, you know, looks like, a, like an analog watch, but it also has a digital display. Uh, but what you can do with this, do you, anybody remember calculator watches? They used to have these tiny little buttons on there, like, you know, super tiny. Uh, well, Casio found a solution. They actually just made the whole screen a touch screen. Um, and you can basically sketch out, you know, like, you know, your numbers and your calculator signs, you know, plus or minus or equals. So you do like three plus four equals and it will, you know, display the result for you. Uh, that's pretty cool, right? There's just one catch on that, uh, which is uh, this thing was released in 1984. So what I'm trying to show you here is that while we might think that, you know, stuff like, let's say, the iPhone was this, like, single stroke of genius that happened in isolation, that is not what's going on, right? All these things you know, are developing out of a whole sequence of innovations that, you know, first they don't make it out of the lab, then they make it into a product, but it's not commercially successful, and then at some point it catches on. Um, but everybody's just building on what's already out there. So there is no single hero uh, in... Uh, invention in general, but also in, um, you know, user interface inventions. So yeah, even interfaces that 
seem radically new, like maybe the, um, the iPhone, are actually built on lots of previous iterations. Um, uh, and that is sort of an important uh, lesson to just uh, remember. And that's why we're, that's one of the reasons why we're looking back. Um, in fact, um, Bill Buxton had this to say, he's a, he's a famous HCI researcher um, at the University of Toronto and uh, Microsoft Research, and he said, you know, Picasso also knew everything about RJ3, but uh, because he had to know the rules before he knew, um, you know, before he could break them, essentially. And so that's why we're going back. Um, we want to save you guys the trouble of reinventing the wheel, of course, right? You know, just coming up with a crazy new idea and like, ah, okay, that's already out there. Um, and that doesn't mean that your idea isn't good, right? It can still be good, but maybe you have this idea of a touch screen calculator watch, and then if you know that there already was one, you get to study that, right? That's, it's there for you. It gives you a leg up. It speeds up your own development and innovation process because you can build on the results um, from that existing product, for example. Um, so that's, why, that's one of the reasons why we go back through um, you know, a quick history of HCI, um, how it evolved. The other reason for doing this is that, well, I think teaching HCI like, is actually a bit more like uh, teaching architecture than teaching computer science, right? Um, in a way, what we're giving you is uh, the tools to you know, understand users' needs and then create virtual environments, you know, user interfaces that people really enjoy working with and you know, being in, in a way. And that's kind of like what architects are doing, right? Um, except they do it with real buildings and uh, real environments um, and uh, people living in them. But it's not that different. And if you look at any architecture class, they all go back and they look at you know, what Corbusier did and what Frank Lloyd Wright did and what these uh, grand architects of the past did. Not because they were like the best designs or like the best designs to do today, but they had a radically new idea, idea and it shows you how you can kind of like you know, flip the switch and come up with a completely new concept and see how that impacts then um, you know, the, the, uh, the later designs that come after that. So uh, let's go back a couple thousand years here. Um, Pre-computing, right? Um, so. I would like to see, sometimes we have people in class who actually know how to use this thing. Does, has anybody used this, uh, used the abacus here and knows how to who use that? All right, uh, you tell me how that works. So you have like a ones and then the, on your one side and then you go up like tens and hundreds and so on. Okay. You can shift them around. Okay, uh, looks like I only have five beans per section there, not 10 though. Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, it's different from the thing I use. <laughs> okay, okay, so you use a different kind of abacus. Uh, anybody use this, this style with this distribution of beans? You, you kind of like, you're tweaking, yeah? Like, in middle school maybe, but like I, I completely, like I, I know that there's like one row for like the, the, the last digit, I don't uh -huh. know, and then there's like one for the 10 digit, and then um, depending on like, the, the bottom two beams are like the ones that you signal like responsible for which, I think. Ah, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> it was well, a few years ago. It, it's a long time ago. All right, good, thank you very much. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you look at the abacus, you are seeing all there is. There is no hidden functionality. Right? Yes, there are rules how to use this, and there are interpretation rules to make sense of what the beans mean, but the thing is, exposed to you in its entirety, right? There's nothing hidden behind any kind of user interface. So in a way, the abacus doesn't have a UI because the abacus is its own UI, right? And that's possible because it's a very simple system, mechanically speaking, right? There's not much going on. You're pushing a couple of beans back and forth. Um, so there's no layer between the system abacus and the human, right? Um, if it breaks, you can see that it's broken. Uh, there is no, no differentiation between like how it works internally and how you perceive it, right? And that's important to understand because most of the tech that we're using today is completely different from that, right? There is always one or many, many, many hidden layers of complexity that are going on that we don't actually see and that we don't necessarily understand usually uh, and that we don't have to understand if everything goes well. Right? And then if things break, that's when you start seeing like whether you know, all of a sudden the UI, you know, the illusion that we're creating, remember, uh, starts breaking down maybe. Um, 
So here's another example. We're jumping forward, you know, uh, maybe 3,000 years or so. Uh, da Vinci's mechanical calculator. This was the first design of a mechanical calculator. Um, and uh, what you can see here, or maybe you can't see because the image is kind of crappy, but hey, it was, the photo was taken in 1500, right? So, um, no, uh, the, the, uh, this thing actually does have a front, right? It has um, wheels in the front, uh, brass covers that actually show you uh, the, the numbers. And uh, in the back, uh, this thing is then, you know, there's lots of wheels and, and intricate machinery back here in the, uh, in the system that then translates that and does the calculations mechanically. Uh, it wasn't actually built at the time because you know, Da Vinci's idea was right, it was sound, but nobody could make you know, brass wheels at that level of precision. He was literally ahead of his time. Um, so there are modern replicas that actually show that his ideas were sound. Uh, so what you do see here is this is introducing a UI, right? So the user interacts with the tiny little wheels at the front and the mechanism behind, I don't necessarily need to understand what's going on there. My mental model now of the calculator is the wheels at the front and not the mechanism at the back. So that's where we see the differentiation between things that don't have a UI because they are what they are uh, and things that start introducing these layers of abstraction um, that include the user interface. Similarly, here uh, we're now moving through sort of a uh, quick sort of you know idea of, of um, mechanical calculators and so on. Here's an um, arithmetic machine from uh, Pascal in 1642. This was actually a working model, unlike uh, the ones from Da Vinci. Uh, it was able to add and subtract. Uh, Leibniz and Chicard did similar things around that time. And again, we do see that now. Actually, it's you know it's in a closed box already, right? So the user interface and the inner workings are clearly getting um, sort of, you know, uh, differentiated here. Okay. Um, now, what you can take away from this is that we have a very early case, or to even today, we have some things that are just what they are. Um, you know, a, a, a simple shovel, you know, there's nothing really hidden inside it, mostly. Uh, but, you know, these are things that, that are what they are, and then they are, you basically get from this direct representation of your conceptual model into increasing levels of abstraction. Now let's move on to computers. Uh, uh, one of the first computers, people are always debating, you know, was Sousa the one that built the first computer or was it, the, was ENIAC the first one? It depends on how you define computer, but um, interestingly, these early, early computers um, didn't actually have memory to store a program. Uh, the way you programmed them was with these plug boards. So you would actually basically wire up your program um, plugging in cables to, to make this computer do certain things. Um, so in a way you can say this thing uh, <coughs> was only able to store data but not programs. Uh, and this was a very, very uh, sort of early version of uh, how you could imagine, again, your program in this case is very much in front of you with these, with these, uh, with these plugs. Um, and there is not really a, a way to store the program in the computer. Interesting interface. This picture is also uh, amusing because that's ENIAC here, and this is von Neumann, uh, when in reality he didn't you know, invent ENIAC, but he actually invented the new computing architecture that you guys probably all know from, from your uh, computing lectures um, that basically you know, made ENIAC obsolete because the von Neumann architecture looks more like this, right? So you got your CPU, uh, you got your ALU, and you got your memory, external storage, output devices, input devices. This is exactly how he envisioned his key idea. This was Neumann's key idea was not to just store, to store not just data, but also the program itself in memory, right? This led to the von Neumann architecture. Um, and uh, this architecture makes perfect sense because back then it's the CPU was super expensive, right? This was, this was expensive technology. Um, so when you look at uh, Neumann's descriptions uh, of his architecture, it actually does include input and output devices. But uh, conceptually, they are, you know, the UI idea is mashed together with other things like um, the, the printer as an output device. So there's no uh, idea uh, that you know this that that this device actually sort of has 
dedicated UI or this architecture has dedicated UI components. It's just, you know, these input devices, whether it's you know, reading stuff um, from, you know, a, a, um, a teletype or whether it is um, reading stuff from somewhere else and whether it's writing to a printer or to a display screen uh, wouldn't really matter here because they're just input output devices. But at least we do have uh, these things. So the key advances here, uh, this is actually still defining what the basic components of today's computer look like, uh, which is kind of amazing if you think about it, you know, how, how computing has evolved and that this architecture is still uh, largely in place today. And of course, the idea of storing instructions in memory. And, and Konrad Zuse came up uh, with about the same uh, idea around the same time. Uh, so that's why it's roughly similar to the Tsuza uh, Z1, Z4 computers that came out in the uh, early 30s um, until 1950. Now, um, now we're going to get into how did these things, you know, what was the UI of these computers? Um, how did you actually interact with them? And the first way to interact with these things uh, that we're interested in at least is mainframes uh, that did batch processing. So you have to imagine it like this, uh, you would basically grab, you know, you would write your code out, you would put it on these punch cards, or have somebody translate it onto these punch cards where you basically punch out you know, little holes to say what kind of digit you want on each uh, position. So it's kind of like a matrix of rows of, of, of numbers one to 10 or zero to nine, and uh, then you would hand that stack to you know, the operator at the desk, and then he would take that stack and bring it back to the computer, would put it into the computer, the computer would suck it in, would read that program, would run it, um, and would output probably you know, uh, you know, a printer output to, to, for you to look at. Or maybe the results there are also uh, you know, output on punch cards, who knows? And then you come back the next day and you pick up your, you know, your, the results. Um, so that's actually uh, the basic interaction uh, with mainframes of the uh, you know 60s and 70s. Um, so the the idea was that the system would should never wait for human input because the system, like this machine, these computers that were filling whole rooms were expensive, right? Expensive to keep up. So they should always be busy. And people people's time was cheap by comparison, right? So um, you bringing your input and then picking up your output the next day, the fact that you had to wait for a day to get your results was not a was not an issue. The important thing was to keep this thing running um, all the time so that it would pay off. Um, but now, uh, punch cards uh, represented both programs and data uh, you know, using these these uh, these whole uh, patterns. Um, and if you think about it, if we if we try to imagine this as a human computer interaction, it's like there's one point in time where you actually hand your stack of punch cards sort of to the computer. And then it's another point in time where the computer reports back to you, but there's no way to influence what's happening in between. Right? It's just, you know, the computer is doing its thing and you are not even in the same building probably uh, to do anything to it. And you have no way to talk to the computer or to maybe, you know, adjust some parameters of your simulation or whatever you were running uh, while the program was running. So there was no feedback while the program was running. It was all just in points of time. And that's why, um, you know, this is using the machine very efficiently. It wasn't waiting for human input. And that's why uh, uh, it's sometimes called a zero dimensional user interface, like a point, right? There's just points in time where you interact with them. Uh, this, this zero dimensionality is based on um, a classification that uh, Jacob Nielsen um, uh, came out with. Uh, he wrote a book called Usability Engineering uh, that was very successful to bring uh, usability into, the, into companies. Um, and, and he came up with this classification of zero D and then we'll see 1D and 2D and so on. Um, don't take the dimensionality too mathematically uh, serious, right? So they are not exact mathematical definitions as you might see them in computer graphics. It's more to give you a, a sense of what's going on in these interactions. All right, so um, what happened next was that, you know, punch cards, of course, uh, got replaced um, by electronic terminals. And uh, first of all, we would see uh, systems that were giving you more immediate response. So you didn't have to wait for a whole day for your punch card results to come back, um, but uh, you would basically be able to 
you know, type in, you know, run a command on a terminal and then have that program execute and see the results back on your terminal seconds or minutes later, right? So this is, um, this is a, a new way of interacting. Now still, there was not a, this was not you interacting with the mainframe all the time. It was more like you were typing into a stupid terminal and then it would send up that, off that command stream to the mainframe and then that would come back with its results once the program was run. So it's still the same fundamental idea. And these systems were uh, not for general purpose computing, they were, um, you know, for example, for you know, just to run something for, a, for an insurance company or something like that. So the concept behind these early systems and these early terminal systems was time sharing. Right? Uh, the idea here being that uh, you wanted now to move away slowly from these batch processing systems to actually uh, time shared systems, which means uh, we have lots of people who have terminals and who all use a single computer, they're all sharing the same computer, um, because again, a computer's super, super expensive, right? Um, and so you've got lots of terminal lines going into the computer and they're all running their own programs on that computer and the computer is basically just rotating through these tasks and executing one after the other. Um, and that idea uh, basically means that you, you type a command line on your terminal, uh, initially they were, you know, they were mechanical devices, uh, later on they became uh, computer screens, um, but in either case, what you were doing is you were typing in your whole command and then you would send it off and the command would get still get sent to the computer, would get executed there. Now you were time sharing with other users so others were able to do the same at the same time in other offices. Um, and then the results would come back to you on the next line. Um, the results initially would come back on um, a piece of paper that was printing out, right? So you literally would just get print out line by line to see what was going on. Uh, later on, you would able, be able to see that print out instead on a computer screen. Um, what's interesting about this is that this was the underlying foundation of the earliest operating systems that we guys still tend, tend to use today because uh, 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 MIT invented the compatible time sharing system and then because they love to give things funny names, they invented the incompatible time sharing system, ITS, and this essentially then ultimately led to the first flavors of Unix, right? And Unix is what we still use today, whether you're running a Linux laptop or whether you're running, um, you know, Mac OS X, for example, or Mac OS or iOS are all based on, on a, a Unix kernel. Um, so what's interesting about the, um, the interaction here is that uh, you are basically working with what you could call a one-dimensional user interface. Uh, you have to imagine it like this, you type in a command, and this is actually something you can still do today, right? You type in a command um, and you send off the command, and when you send off the command, that's it, right? That's the end of your interaction with the program, and then the program executes, and it comes back with a result and displays it on, on your console. But while the program is running, you cannot interact with it. Now, today, for most programs, you don't notice this, right? If you say ls on a Unix system to list the contents of the directory, it feels like, you know, it's just a command, it's, it's there right away, but literally, you are launching the ls program and telling it, you know, not giving it any parameters, so it just lists the content of the current directory. It does that output, while it's doing that, you cannot influence what it's doing, and when it's done, it returns to the command prompt for you to run the next program in a way, right, to, to issue the next command in your, in your batch, uh, in, in your shell, yeah. But we are still able to uh, cancel or kill the process at any time if we want to. Yes, yes, so yeah, that's a good point. You can go in and if you have a program that's running too long, you can get into the process management and actually kill the program. That's a good point. Uh, so that's a little bit of an advantage that you have today uh, that you can do that, uh, that you wouldn't have back there because nowadays you can just open up two, three, four terminal windows, uh, but that would literally translate to two, three or four of these machines in front of you back in the day. 
So uh, Nielsen calls this 1D interfaces. Why? Because you are basically entering a string of commands, and this string of commands gets to the computer, and the computer answers back in a string of, 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 of let letters, characters, basically. Um, so you don't have any kind of, for example, the full screen editor, right? The full screen editor would not be possible with this paradigm. Um, because the full screen editor requires you to run the editor, and while the editor is running, to take user input and move a cursor around right, in response. That's not possible when all I'm doing is launching little batch programs that just execute entirely and come back and finish, and then when they're done, uh, I can do the next thing. Okay. All right. So, um, but this is why we we tend to call these things. Um, um, 1D inter interfaces. And if, you, if you're a Unix freak, then you can actually still try out uh, how this feels, right? Not just with your command line where you're launching commands and then they come back, but there are even editors that you can run, like Ed, for example, a line editor that will only let you edit one line of your code at a time, right? You cannot actually do full screen editing. It's, 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 it's really annoying because you never get an overview of your text and can't just move around and scroll around and copy and paste and all that. You have to literally like say, oh, I want to edit line 15 of my code or something. Uh, but that's the way that it would work if all you have is this kind of interface, right? Um, now we're gonna take a look at a, a vision because time-wise it fits into this time. Uh, although the vision itself was far ahead of what it was proposing, uh, far ahead of its time. And this is uh, Memex. So Memex is a vision of computing that Vannevar Bush uh, proposed in a, an article uh, that was called As We May Think. So what he was trying to picture in this article was uh, a vision of how people might work as knowledge workers, if you like, as information um, technology users in the future. Now remember, this was in 1945. So the ENIAC had just been invented, right? There were no computers around you know, Bush at the time. Um, it was just at the end of the Second World War. Um, and uh, what we'll see is the Memex that uh, Bush proposed it was a device that he imagined that would store all of an individual's books, records, and, you know, he doesn't talk about music records here, it means like you know, personal records, like data uh, written on paper, and all their communications, so letters or uh, telexes, I guess, at the time. Um, and um, he imagined a device that would store all this information and let you know, people consult it with, as they called it, exceeding speed and flexibility. Um, this was a very weird, I, I don't know what, you know, what he was really thinking, but it was quite amazing that he was essentially foreseeing what computers would be able to do, you know, 30, 40 years later um, in, his, in his vision. And I'll show you a little picture of how he imagined it. Uh, what he predicted was not just the personal computer, essentially, what, what he descri was describing here. He was also predicting the networking of these computers, the internet as being able to exchange information with others, the World Wide Web, and essentially, uh, he was expecting, you know, he was, he was envisioning speech recognition, online encyclopedia, so Wikipedia, you might say, um, and, and hypertext, linking things together. Um, so this is a uh, this is a reading uh, that I'd like you to do um, on how you know, um, Vannevar Bush uh, imagined this, and we will see a little video. Now this video isn't from Bush himself; it's a later version that was created that was trying to uh, picture the device that Bush was imagining. Because here's somebody who has all these crazy ideas of how you know people could work with information, but all the tech he's got around him is like, you know, microfilm and, you know, basically mechanical analog ways of, of handling data. So we'll see how he put these things together. Um, uh, this Memex video here, uh, I, I will just let this run because it has a little bit of an audio track to it. Uh, and so you guys should be able to follow along with this, but I'll comment it if, if anything is unclear. <laughs> So here we have the uh, you know the work desk basically that you uh, that you expect. The to owner see. of the Memex, let us say, is interested in the properties of the bow and arrow. 
He has dozens of possibly pertinent books and articles in his Memex. First he runs through an encyclopedia, finds an interesting but sketchy article, and leaves it projected. Next, in a history, he finds another pertinent item and ties the two together. Thus he goes, building a trail of many items. Occasionally, he inserts a comment of his own, either linking it into the main trail or joining it by a side trail to a particular item. His trails do not fade. Several years later, his talk with a friend turns to the Turkish bow. In fact, he has a trail on it. It is an interesting trail, pertinent to the discussion. So he sets a reproducer in action, photographs the whole trail out, and passes it to his friend for insertion in his own memex. see a couple parts inside the Memex, you know, lots of microfilm projection displays with screens on them. To the right you see lots of um, film wheels that would contain microfilm data, basically the database of information that was stored in there. Um, and what you maybe saw from this, uh, from this video uh, was that it actually uh, showed something akin to like a Google search, right? You know, interested in something, I find some interesting information, uh, I'm actually able to annotate it, which is still hard to do today on your, on your computer or in your tablet, at least if you want the annotation to stick with the original content. Um, and then, you know, he's able to link this to some other information using a hyperlink and then share that uh, sort of browsing history, if you like, uh, with somebody else um, who then uh, copies it in. Uh, that's quite amazing for somebody who did this in 1945, I think. So um, uh, the Memex keeps coming up in HCI as a, um, you know, as an example of a really, really early case of having an idea of how things might work, uh, but the technology is just not being there to make this really practical. Um, because copying at that time literally meant, you know, photocopying something uh, from a microfilm. Now this is an effect that we see quite often in HCI especially, but also in innovation in general, uh, which uh, Bill Buxton called the long nose of innovation. Um, you know, when the web 2.0 was fancy, then people called about the long tail, right? The long tail of websites. There's so many small websites out there that make up most of the content on the internet, uh, but there is incredibly diverse. There's a long tail of small uses. And, and Buxton took this idea and said, there's also a long nose of innovation, meaning that when something gets invented uh, first, like, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, comes up in 1984 with uh, maybe, you know, the, the, the Casio watch here, or maybe that's already a little bit down the line. Somebody must have invented touch screens before that. Uh, and then, you know, the idea gets refined, augmented, you know, tossed around. Uh, and at some point then it gets productized. And for most people it's under the radar all that time, right? And only when it comes out, uh, like, you know, this would be, you would say like when the iPhone got released for, for touch uh, devices, um, that you would then see, you know, this thing going off. Um, uh, the iPhone is a great example because, um, you know, there was a device from my IBM called the Simon that was in the 80s that was essentially a touchscreen phone with apps on the home screen and all that. Uh, you can see it in the, uh, in the TV show For All Mankind. They put it in there in the alternate history. Um, so the long nose of innovation is showing us that we are actually, when we see things, when we notice technology, there's usually already 20 years, sometimes 30 years of uh, invention that has happened uh, before that. Um, and that's also true, I think, for sure with uh, what, what Bush was proposing. Some of his ideas, you know, became true 20 years later, some 30, some took even longer. 
Now, let's get back to the, uh, the history of, of divisive. So meanwhile, in the real world, right? Well, Vannevar Bush is having these pipe dreams. Um, meanwhile, what was happening in the real world was that uh, systems were being created uh, that would start having real-time responses. Uh, first of all, this was happening in very uh, domain-specific tasks, like not something that you'd use for general purpose. This was, for example, in air defense, the SAGE system uh, in, in the 60s allowed uh, the operator here to look at these screens and uh, actually sort of, you know, uh, have a graphical screen uh, showing where, whatever, where flights and, 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 and objects and obstacles were and being able to interact with these things. Um, and uh, this was, you could say, the first graphical user interface, sort of, kind of, uh, although it was not really a general purpose GUI, right? It wasn't really a device that you could do anything with, like with today's computers. It was really a device um, that would only let you, uh, would operators only let, uh, would let operators only do their flight tracking uh, tasks that they had to do here. Um, the, the, the whole idea of SAGE was to be sort of, you know, radars picking up flight paths uh, that would get via phone lines, would get sent to computers, and these computers would be hooked up to these CRTs, um, these, these uh, monitors here, and then the operator could see that data. Um, <clears throat> the first actual general purpose graphical user interface was created uh, by Ivan Sutherland um, with Sketchpad. And Sketchpad is uh, widely known as sort of the first true interactive, more general purpose um, computer graphics program. Um, its key advances were that it introduced the techniques for directly manipulating graphics on the screen. Um, and this included things like constraint satisfaction. We will actually see a short video that explains that. So uh, you would actually be able to um, use uh, a couple of devices. There is a there's a pen here and there's, there's sorry, is, is there a question you guys have over? No, okay. Um, uh, there, there's a pen that this guy's interacting with with screen on, uh, there are knobs that he's turning and twiddling, uh, and there's buttons that he's pressing, and that lets him interact with um, a graphical content on the screen. Um, what you'll see is a video that um, uh, was taken back then, and uh, apart from seeing people um, wearing really cool sort of 60s style glasses in this video, uh, it's also interesting to see how um, first you see very simple sort of, you could say, uh, Adobe Illustrator style sort of 2D uh, sketching, uh, but then it actually turns into a 3D sketching thing, and then it actually also includes a segment on um, a graphical programming environment that actually lets you assemble programming blocks on the screen to build code, uh, which is quite mind-blowing. So uh, let's take a look at Sutherland's sketchpad here. So this um, uh, video, uh, I'll just roll this and uh, I'd like you to pay attention to the devices that are being used and the interaction techniques that are being introduced. How do you actually go about communicating with a, a computer in a graphical sense? Well, we are using an oscilloscope here, which is much like a, uh, a TV set, except it's being driven by the computer. Uh, in order to get the information into the computer, we have to draw somehow on this display. And we use the light pen. Well, in order to construct a meaningful engineering drawing, we have to have several graphical manipulations. Ivan's Sutherland's programs can draw straight lines and circles. Well, that's about what you do in a, the drafting equipment anyway, isn't it? That's a very good start. <laughs> in order to do this, we can position this bright spot in the middle, middle of the cross that you notice at a desired location. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my light pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the screen here, and the other is at my light pen. So I can position this anywhere I want. Now, I lost tracking there. I moved the pen too fast, and that told the computer to stop drawing the line. Well, if you notice, that bright dot will jump onto the line as I get close to it. Well, the dot in the center of the cross, when you get close to the line, jumps over onto it. Correct. Why does it, it, it do that? It's much like a gravity field at the end point. It, it is even a higher gravity field to allow us to position the point exactly on the line, or in this case, exactly at the end point. This allows me to move my pen quite coarsely, be sloppy while I'm drawing, mm -hmm. and get a, a precision drawing off at the same time. So now I'm going to draw a second line. 
Okay. And even the third one. Now, in an ordinary uh, pencil and paper drawing, all we have is this particular picture. But the computer understands the geometry of the drawing here. What do I mean? I mean that if I point at this particular point and tell the computer to move that point by another push button command, it will move not only that point, but all three lines that are attached to it. And the delay between it's doing what you want it to uh, is um, because it's computing all these changes. That That's correct. Now, if I made a mistake, I could delete my mistake by pointing at the line in question, for instance, and pressing the appropriate button. It's gone. Now, I mentioned before we could draw circles also. Okay. In order to do this, I must first indicate the center of my circle. Uh, let's choose it to be here. And then I'll move out to an initial radius. Let's say this point right here. And I press the second button to start drawing the circle. Here's a circle. In other words, the computer has supplied the compass here, much like it supplied the straight edge for the straight line. If you go backwards, you erase it. And I can wind it up the other way. Mm -hmm. Now, if I tell the computer to put that point right at this circle, right in that point right there, mm -hmm. the computer knows that those must be connected. It turns out that they're not really connected. It's a very small nub there. Let me move this away and show you that they're really not connected. But I have told that by terminating the point, the pin at that position, that it must be connected. Now, I can tell the computer to satisfy this constraints command by bringing in a program under command of this toggle. And watch this go. You see now that, indeed, the circle is ending at that line. We have constrained the drawing to behave this way. So I've selected a blank piece of paper, we'll call it. We have several pieces of paper. And I can, let's say I'm beginning to design. I have a very nebulous idea what I want to uh, have in mind. And as I draw my part, let's say, on the scope, it reinforces what I have in mind. This is, in general, part of the design process. And as I apply design criteria, stresses, and so on, eventually I will know what the exact shape of this part is. I shouldn't be required to, to draw the exact shape to begin with, at the beginning. I really don't know what it is. But let's say I've decided eventually in this model that I want these to be horizontal or vertical, a box. I can apply a new constraint, a horizontal constraint here, and a vertical constraint here, and a horizontal here, by pointing at the line and pressing a button. Well, no, nothing has happened yet, because remember, I still must tickle that toggle over there to command the computer to satisfy these constraints. I see. It won't actually let those rubber bands relax then until you say so. Right. And I'll do that and watch again. There we have a box. Now, what I can do, in addition to this, is call up copies of master pictures. Remember that picture we drew before. Mm -hmm. I think it looks oh, something there. like that. <laughs> That's right. What I've done is I regard that first picture as a master. Mm -hmm. and I call up a copy of it, and I can manipulate it locally. I can reduce it, magnify it, I can rotate it, and then we place it right there. And I can do this several times. This is, of course, very instrumental for repetitive drawings, like circuit diagrams or bridge bays, where we have several repetitive structures. Now, imagine that when I was doing my design work, I made a mistake in my master. Well, in order to correct that mistake, it would go back, and let's say I don't really want this circular segment to be in here. I erase it. Now I have the problem of making this, these changes to all the occurrences of this copy in my working drawing. This is very tedious nowadays with pencil and paper. We have to remember where all the changes are. Now you notice, you remember the drawing, that we now have lost our circular arcs. Incidentally, I would like to ask you how uh, big this piece of paper that you keep referring to is and how many pieces of paper you have available to you. Ah, well, this scope, which measures about seven inches on the side, we regard this as a window that we can move over our paper and, and enlarge the size of this window. We can 
I imagine the computer has a fixed sheet of paper behind this window. Its scale is approximately two miles inside. Two miles? Right. And let's look at that. I can reduce this drawing slightly. And let me call up a copy of that master drawing again. Put it over the center there. Oops. I've hit one stop already. That's as small as you could. We're looking at the whole piece of paper, so. Correct. Mm -hmm. And let me magnify it now. And now it's magnified so it's practically off the screen. Place another one in there. So like the picture within a picture within a picture idea. Right, it's real nightmare material. And it's gonna get smaller, back. even though the spot sort of disappears, uh, it's really still there, isn't it? Most of the things, though, that we live with in this world are, are three-dimensional rather than uh, two-dimensional pictures like that. Is it possible to use a computer in that kind of problem? Yes. We've expanded Ivan Sutherland's program into three dimensions. I have to bring that off the magnetic tape. There, we have that now. Here we have a single three-dimensional object as seen from four separate views. We have a top view, as indicated by the T here, a front view, and a side view. We can rotate this perspective separately from these three views to get an idea of what we have here. I begin to rotate it. You see it's rotating about an axis perpendicular imaginary floor. We have a wireframe object here with no fabric covering. Hence, we see the rearward lines as they come in behind this S, which might be lying in the surface. Sorry. But there is no fabric here, so we see everything. Now, we are drawing much like we are in two-dimensional, except we're with that is by moving a single point around for the light band. But we're drawing directly in 3D. Here, I have latched the pen onto the letter S. And as I move this around in the letter S, you see four dots moving in all the four views. This is the projection of the single dot. In the side view, it's actually also following the S, but in the other two, um, you're sort of looking at the S on edge, so it's just moving back and forth. Right, and this is because the S is indeed in the plane of that side surface. Let's put a rough on this object in this fashion. We'll latch onto that corner, and we'll draw a pyramid. If I latch onto this line here, or let's say this line over here, I can pull that out to the side and distort the object slightly. Now let's see what we've drawn here. We'll rotate the perspective of this view again. What a strange looking object. And now we have a warped house under construction, perhaps. Well, you heard Tim Johnson explain how to construct solid objects with lines and uh, wire figures. However, if we want to manipulate solid objects with the computer, we want to be able to represent their surfaces and so on as solid. Now, here we have a representation of a uh, piece of wood, perhaps, which is all of the lines of the sections behind each piece are hidden. As you'll see, as I start to rotate this object, the computer will place part of it behind the other part, and you will see that, indeed, the computer has a representation of it, which knows that it's solid. It's no longer just that wire frame. It really is solid, and when a line is behind the front surface, you just don't see it. That's right. As I move the wedge around in space, you'll see that it goes behind the solid and through it. And the computer figures out where the line should appear and where they should. Where the intersection is. You get and the feeling of three-dimensional space here very dramatically, uh, uh, as though this were a window and a, a, a floor area and a behind area. Right. Now, as this comes out through the other object, you see that it indeed intersects it and can move right through it. Now, we also have been working with the flow charting of programs. To instruct a computer what to do, you need to write a program. A flow chart, then, would be sort of a diagram of the steps that you'd want the computer to take in solving some particular problem? Yes, in fact, I have a flow chart on here. 
this is with Sketchpad and again, and we have a demonstration of boxes representing statements to the computer to do some operation and compare some numbers and make a test and transfer one way or the other. This is the way a human being would like to set it up by drawing boxes like this would represent different computations. This is the way that a programmer normally operates and then he has to transcribe this to some form like cards or something as an input. But here we go directly from him drawing the flow chart and stating what each piece is, putting the statements inside the boxes to a compiled program which he may execute on the computer. Well, we've been investigating here at the lab speech recognition and handwriting recognition for enabling the person to communicate better in those ways with the computer. There are a lot of techniques which would be very useful when combined into a whole. And all of these techniques, including the graphical manipulation, will make it much easier in the future for the man to dynamically converse with a computer. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Today, we've been visiting the MIT Lincoln Laboratory to learn about the computer sketchpad. Our guests have been Professor Stephen Coons, Mr. Timothy Johnson, and Dr. Lawrence Roberts. I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter. Uh, that was a lot of stuff, okay. Um, some things that I hope you noticed is, first of all, interaction with the light pen, right? So that was kind of like a precursor to the mouse, maybe. Uh, and we still see, of course, pen interaction today on, on tablets, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the new thing here, of course, was that you were actually able to directly manipulate objects on, on that screen, right, with that light pen. Uh, then what, what you may have noticed, at some point, he was actually moving uh, this triangle thing towards the square thing, whatever he was constructing there. And while he was moving it, he was also scaling and rotating it. That's pretty weird, right? Try that in Adobe today. Like, you know, it's actually not usually possible unless, you know, you use multi-touch gestures. Why? Because we have mostly, for the last 30, 40 years, we've mostly reduced interaction down from what these guys are doing to just a mouse, which is a single point of interaction uh, that you can basically do stuff at, right? So. Um, he has additional like wheels and knobs on his device that he can turn with his left hand while his right hand, the light pen, is moving something. He can use his left hand to to like scale or rotate something. That is pretty nifty, um, and actually something we haven't seen for a long time until you know the uh, advent of multi-touch. Uh, well, you know, there were things like, you know, uh, master and copy things like basically using uh, using links rather than copies of objects, right? So that if you change one, the other changes along with that. Um, there was hidden line algorithms running. Uh, you could sketch in 3D and even uh, doing graphical programming, right? That was kind of um, quite surprising for me. And, I love, this is like in the 60s, and this guy is like, yeah, yeah, and so we've kind of solved this whole like GUI thing. I think we're gonna do speech recognition now and handwriting recognition, I think, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, best MIT style. Uh, so, uh, but compare this, right? Imagine seeing this when all you have seen so far, which was batch processing and, you know, hacking at a teletype, um, interacting with the computer purely via text so far, right? This was quite a uh, revelation. The next system we're gonna take a, a closer look at um, is, a, is a really interesting one. Um, the, uh, the demo that uh, the guy gave, Doug Engelbart, who, who came up with this system, is known on, on the internet as the mother of all demos because he did such a great job explaining what he was doing um, by actually demoing it uh, rather than telling people about what, it, what the system could do. He's literally using his own system during the demo, talking about it while he's you know, um, showing off the various features of it, and it's really, uh, really well done. So what N uh, the NLS system will show us is um, a system that is a little bit more text heavy than what we just saw with the uh, with Sketchpad, but on the other hand, um, it is a system that introduces a whole lot of things that we today understand as working with, you know, uh, linked documents and text, and uh, um, we will see things like. Um, 
the uh, uh, windows introduced, like you know, text divided uh, into windows, uh, hyperlinks. There's video conferencing going on in this thing. Uh, they talk about revision control of different versions of, of documents, word processing, of course, uh, including a, um, a hierarchical uh, document editor that lets you, it's almost like a hierarchical sort of uh, to-do list editor um, that you can unfold and fold out uh, pieces of text um, and uh, work on this even collaboratively. You can edit with two people at the same time. Uh, and of course, most famously of all, uh, the NLS system, online system from Engelbart, introduced the mouse. Uh, the mouse was in introduced first uh, by Doug Engelbart. It was his invention uh, with his colleagues. He came up with this design. Uh, so it's uh, it's a f it's a system that focuses on I would say expert use, not on sort of you know casual walk up and use kind of scenarios. So you will see that the system that he uh, introduced actually um, is pretty tricky to use. Uh, here's a picture taken out of the, uh, the video that shows how you actually use it. So you've got a normal computer keyboard, uh, and on the right-hand side, you've got Engelbart's mouse here, right, so being moved around. Um, and on the left-hand side, you actually see a five finger cording keyboard. These are keyboards where you can press multiple keys at the same time to create keyboard combinations. So you've got two to the power of five different combinations that you can do on these things, um, which is um, quite powerful to, it's basically his version of command key shortcuts, right? His, his version of special shortcuts to start copying, moving, um, doing all that kind of stuff. So. Um, in user tests, you know, this, this was not doing well because you really had to spend time with the system to learn how to use it. Uh, and I think Engelbart joked at one point that it's perfect for a trained user with about four hands. Um, and so, but the mother of all demos is what this is really known for. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll uh, just roll the video. And I'd like you to pay attention to the various, um, you know, the various introduced new features here that we're seeing. Um, and again, remember that this is also coming around at a time where most people were still, you know, hadn't, nobody had seen a computer in their home, right? You know, PCs were still mm, 15 years out, right? They hadn't happened yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, people had heard of computers in large buildings, maybe used one at the office and typed on a terminal to get back, um, you know, results from some, unknown mainframe in the, in the basement. They had no influence on, um, on using this for any personal uh, things, really. It was just there to work through you know, pre-built business applications that were very simplistic and, and batch-oriented in nature. So there comes uh, Engelbart, and his vision was really, how can, we in, how can we empower the knowledge worker of the future to work with information um, you know, as effortlessly as possible uh, so he's kind of continuing the line of thinking that um, that mimics from uh, uh, the 1945 uh, article sort of inspired. So let's uh, roll this video. So I'm putting in an entity called a statement, and that's full of other entities called words. And if I make some mistakes, I can back up a little bit. So I have a, a statement with some entities' words, and I can do some operations on these. I can copy a word. I can say that word like copy after itself. In fact, that pair of words I like copy after itself, and I can just do this a few times and get a bit of uh, material there. And there are other entities like text. Say after there, I'd like to copy from that entity point to that point, and it'll copy it. Great. Let's make more statements. I'll say copy that statement. And lo and behold, I have another one. Copy that one, another one. I can even copy groups of statements. I can say after that one, copy the group from there to there. And it does. I can look at that and say, hmm, probably goes off the screen. It'd be interesting if I could ask the computer to collapse that, perhaps to show me just the first line of each of those statements. All right, please do that. So it did. This is one aspect of what we'll use over and over again through this presentation, what we call view control. So let me jump back to the head of the list, and I can do things like begin to reorganize it a little bit. Well, I say after bananas, it's more likely that I'll um, take the carrots there, and so carrots move right up behind bananas, and aspirin doesn't really belong there. Uh, I think aspirin goes after paper towels in the order. Well, pretty soon I would, uh, 
I would begin to have a lot of trouble keeping that straight. So let me organize it by saying, uh, just generally produce. So I'll say, well, produce, I'll categorize things. Let me uh, look at it that way and I'll say, let me move a statement for produce and carrots. And I'd like to subcategorize it so it moved. And there it is. All right, produce, I've got carrots. And I'll move under there also bananas. And in fact, I could move a whole group under there, say oranges and apples also. So I can begin categorizing things like that. And if I looked at the numbers now, I'd find that these, these items fit under there as a subset. And I realize I can categorize quite extensively. I could introduce a new thing under there. There was uh, something I just invented, a skinless banana, but I have to go there. And look at it. So part of our view control, besides this thing we've shown you of showing numbers or not, is also whether we can show you some of these different levels or not. I can say, well, I want to see two levels. But there's another thing I can do. There's a root I said I have here. So here, I'm afraid I'll need a different picture of the view. <laughs> so here's what I drew with a picture drawing capability here. It's a slight map if I start from work. And here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that. And oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. What if I, what am I supposed to pick up the drugstore? Hmm, I see, you're interesting. All right. Market. Oh, I've already seen that. Why does it like that? Hmm. Gee, that's too much. Anyway, so we have this feature of structuring our material hierarchically. You can find out the definitions of a lot of terms. Here's sort of a glossary. Well, let's do the thing called freeze a statement and then oh, and say, put that at the top. Lo and behold, that statement now is going to be frozen in our display scanning windows from the dotted line down. And then we know about names and jumping to name, and so we can say, what's a bug? Oh, down here tells you what a bug is. I see. Well, let's see. Uh, what's a level? Select level. Tells you what level is. What's, what's a mouse? That's fun to look at. There's a mouse, you can just point. So you can sit here and point to successive terms, and it goes there, the scanning window goes there, the frozen glossary stays, and you can see the definitions. Very nice, and some of the definitions, you can recognize terms here. That's an odd one, maybe that's a name. Let's just see. Oh, sure enough, it's a sketch showing the mouse and the mouse buttons. Very nice. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot where you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called a mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. It'll show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrew's hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. All right, as it moves up or down or sideways, so does the tracking spot. and the. The principles for its operation are quite easy to see. You'll turn it over, Don. Can you hear me, Don? Would you turn it over? We'll see, right. Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. But since they're at right angles and kind of sharp edges, one roll and the other slide in one direction. Each of, it, each of these wheels controls through a potentiometer with a voltage output sampled by an ADD converter. The numbers taken in by the computer at sample times as to what the horizontal vertical components are to be of where it should put the tracking spot. 
this device over here is unique to us, and we always have to justify and explain it. We'll do it in reverse order. We'll explain it first. <laughs> it provides for you the one hand equivalent of what you can do with a keyboard. There are five keys, and normally each finger sits on a key, and depressing any one key at a time produces a character. And any two keys at a time also. And in fact, any combination of depressing, of which there are 31 combinations, and one of their designers, Jack Kelly, came one day and spent a day working with us about our ideas about our control consoles as being separated from display consoles and ended up making this on a chair that I can get up, move around, and sit down, and swivel, and lock, rock, and lean back, and work very relaxed. Now you've seen most of the way through here how this serves as a very powerful tool for an individual to work when he's studying, doing his planning, designing, debugging, documenting. But we also saw through the medium of leaving messages for each other and filtering them that people can collaborate quite well over a period of time by working on joint files. In fact, you can have a joint file and go leave a message and get a response in a matter of minutes because they're all available instantly by anybody from one of these terminals. But there's another degree of collaboration which is very important and which we're just going to be setting up in the next few months the hardware to do computer aid. But here we're going to set it up with a little bit of people aid too. So I'm going to establish a collaborative mode between me and another terminal. Bill Paxton is at a terminal back at SRI. So Bill, will you come in through this intercom? Hello, Doug. Hi. So this is collaborative I editing now what over distance. On, Bill. 13. Okay. I'd like to have him see my text. And so this special thing, if I label 13, will switch, switch over. So on his display, he sees my text. So I'll execute it. And sure enough, it does. But what's that running around? Well, if he's looking at my text, he'd like to have something to say about it. So we put on a marker, a tracking spot that he controls. So he's sitting in a mental park looking at this text, and he can point to it. But we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this. So my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. <laughs> so. All right, so uh, in case you haven't been listening, Bill, <laughs> we've been going through lots of examples and setting up in collaboration here so that we can go on into information retrieval. And we've set up now audio coupling and we're both looking at the same display and that'd be very handy to work. We could talk to each other and point and maybe later I could hand you the chalk on this blackboard like saying, here, you control it. But let's stay this mode now and add another feature that hardware-wise is available to the kind of display we have. I'd like to see you while I'm working on it. So before I can do that, I have to set up my display in a certain way. Set it up so it, I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there, and I say, now computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great, now we're connected audio, you can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So that's a nice example, um, I think, of a whole bunch of things that uh, many of these we now take for granted, right? So they were essentially having kind of a Zoom call with a shared uh, screen here and, and even you know, like a shared Google document, maybe you'd say, where they could both um, edit um, at the same time. Um, but uh, even before that sort of collaboration setting, which of course, as you can see, was kind of, it was kind of a fake setup because the, the, the video, of course, was coming in through an analog camera feed, right? This was not uh, being uh, piped over in a, in a digital form at this point. Um, but uh, the uh, many of the things that we saw here, like the hyperlinks, for example, like the, the editing and then being able to just click on, the, on something and then jumping to a different part of text uh, was was foreseeing the, the idea of hyperlinks that we then saw uh, really take off with the World Wide Web. Um, we also saw a hierarchical list um, editing, right, you know, folding in, folding out uh, parts of content. Uh, there were a few simple graphical sketches in there, though less graphical than, than what Sketchpad did. Uh, and you may have noticed a split window. 
too, right? There was, at the top, there was some text, a list of keywords, and you could click on one of those, and the bottom half of the screen was turning into that other content. So not windows in the sense that we know them from, from the desktop, uh, but windows still in the sense of split views. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was to me um, uh, quite surprising and uh, I do invite you to watch the full video. You see, we, we cut this down so it was a little bit of, uh, of, a, of a jarred experience maybe uh, with these things coming in rapid succession. So I do invite you to watch the whole uh, demo online and see um, how it all plays out and then you may be able to even understand a little better what, uh, what Doug Engelbart is introducing there. Now, um, what I also wanted to share is um, I ended up meeting Doug Engelbart when I was working at Stanford in uh, 2001, 2003, that time. Um, he actually ended up um, giving a talk, uh, which was, I think, celebrating, um, you know, uh, the, uh, I don't know how many years of, of, of mouse encounters, right? And, and this was held up there. And so uh, I ended up seeing that talk, um, meeting him, and also I got to um, handle this uh, original mouse prototype that he had brought with him. Um, this is sort of uh, showing the very first version, like a wooden box, a little chip. I, I love that look. And also you can see it's like a, a single sort of like maker style push button there in the top that was being used. Also this one was, um, uh, the, the early versions of the mouse, you may have noticed this in the video, actually often have the wire coming out at the bottom, right? You know, it looks a lot like a mouse, but is actually not very practical. So that got uh, turned around a little, I think, uh, later on. Uh, and of course, only one button on here, even though uh, the later picture I showed you um, had already extended to three buttons. Um, and here's the two uh, metal wheels. So this is a picture I, I took um, um, from, you know, after turning the mouse over these two brass, um, you know, manufactured wheels um, that were scraping across the desk, sort of. Uh, so not a perfect mechanism, I would say. Even the rubber ball that, you know, some of you may still have seen occasionally was a big improvement over these two wheels. But hey, it worked um, for, for a prototype. And um, what I think is, uh, is interesting on, on the mouse is that, um, you know, very soon people were testing whether the mouse was actually you know a good input device and they found by just you know having your hands on the keyboard and then um, having to uh, you know locate a, a, an object or point at an object on screen they found that the uh, you know, this was the sort of their fastest design for the mouse they did these like performance tests with different designs to see whether they were really nailing it so and that is of course sort of maybe uh, the most obvious legacy of, of what Doug Engelbart did, although the whole of NLS with this you know, hyperlinking, document uh, folding editors, uh, collaborate, collaborative editing uh, was of course also something that influenced a lot of the ideas that came afterwards. So uh, what we're looking at here, uh, I have to say, is really sort of two timelines that you may begin to see here. One is the one of like what's actually available to buy and to use for sort of the general public. And the other one is what's happening in the research labs. Right? And in between these two, there is, of course, a shift of, you know, sometimes several decades um, of ideas. So meanwhile, while um, this was going on in, in you know, in, in research labs, um, what everybody was able to uh, to see uh, uh, was uh, the, the earliest hobbyist PCs and and games. Um, this uh, probably started out um, with uh, uh, Pong from Atari. Um, this was a device that uh, uh, Nolan Bushnell invented in 1972. And uh, while there had been a couple uh, other examples of computer games before, uh, Pong was uh, the first one that reached a bigger um, audience and, uh, and was commercially uh, sort of um, a really a real big success. Uh, the story goes that when um, uh, when uh, Bushnell set up this console in a in a bar in in somewhere in Silicon Valley, um, you know, it, it literally like the heat, you know. Everybody walked up to it and they were like, hmm, what's this doing? And then somebody like would, you know, the, the ball would go like, boop, and disappear, boop, disappear. Somebody would turn this wheel and like, oh, I can move that puddle, boop, boop, oh, look at that, I can play. So they would, you know, throw in 
you know, quarter after quarter to play this game, and soon enough they had a line around the block for you know, all, all the nerds lining up to play this video game that nobody had ever seen before. And, and the next morning, or I don't know when it was, uh, I think next evening, he got a call. Um, and he said, like, oh, Nolan, you know, the Pong machine is broken. You gotta come by and fix it. So he came in and it wasn't working. What had happened was that so many people had played the game that you know they had just used one of those coin connect, uh, collectors from a laundromat, like from an automatic washing machine, and that had filled up with quarters and had reached the top and the coins were shorting out the PCB on top of that. So that's why the game wasn't playing. So all they had to do is like empty out the money and it worked again. That's a nice uh, bug fix. I, I like it when it works that way. Um, so uh, anyway, this was really a big success, I think, in, in, in bringing the idea of live interaction with the computer to, to the masses, right? To the, and it also showed that machines were actually becoming cheap enough so that you could actually um, have them being used by somebody else than government and, and, and big businesses or research labs, which was pretty much all the demos we'd seen so far. There was no idea of a personal computer, right? The other thing that then happened in 1975 was, uh, uh, well, okay, so Star Trek was uh, running, and, and that week um, they were flying to the planet Altair, and that gave uh, a bunch of uh, developers the idea to call their computer the Altair. That's why it's called the Altair. Um, and this is the computer. This is the Altair 8000 something, 8800, sorry. Um, this was a computer that you could buy as a kit, and you could assemble it yourself. Um, and um, the, it cost, I think, about $400 back at the time with 256 bytes of memory. That's uh, really amazing. Uh, you would assemble it at home. Uh, the only input it would have, there was no keyboard. It had uh, LEDs as output, right? rows of LEDs, and switches as inputs, right? That was it. Um, and if you uh, wanted to play a game with it, you could, because there was instructions to, to write a game and, and program this thing to run a game. The game was that um, you would you know, start the game, and then you would flick a switch, and meanwhile, the computer had picked one of the LEDs, and then it would turn on the LED, and if the right LED turned on that you had guessed with your switch, then you win, so. Yeah, it wasn't quite Pong, let's say that. It wasn't quite as exciting. But you know, people still, they were like, I have my own computer, right? Isn't that amazing? And later on, some young dude uh, actually went on and, um, you know, uh, this thing was expandable to eight kilobytes of RAM, um, and the idea for, for uh, expanding it to that amount of RAM was to run a basic interpreter that some young guy by the name of Bill Gates had written. Um, so that's how that came about. Now, the, but these, I wouldn't call these personal computers. There wasn't really much you could do with this. Uh, maybe once you were able to run basic on it, but that was, like I said, that was later. Uh, the, um, sorry, the earliest personal computer that we've seen uh, is probably the Apple II. Um, the Apple I was still one that you had to build yourself and you had to, uh, basically you just got the PCB, the, you know, Steve Wozniak was giving the plans available for free um, and uh, you had to build your own housing for it. So the Apple II was the first commercially available machine that came with, with a box, right? It, it actually was, a, it was uh, the first successful um, personal computer, you know, in, um, interestingly introduced by uh, by Apple, and the the Apple II um, actually ended up being adopted widely in businesses and small businesses. Uh, and why? Not because they were you know, they, the the nerds who wanted to flick a switch and get, see whether they guessed the right LED. No, because this thing was actually able to run a piece of software that businesses were terribly excited about, and that was VisiCalc. And uh, VisiCalc was uh, simply a really, really early version of Excel. Right? It's, a, it's the first time that um, the spreadsheet as a software genre came about. Um, and you could say that probably sold uh, and, and made the Apple uh, to a success, right? Because that was a game changer for business to be able to play, to plan their expenses in that way and to, to do forecasting and, and, and budgeting and all these kinds of things. Um, 
a couple of years later, four years later, uh, IBM followed suit, um, and while you know the the Apple II was being made by some you know hippies in California who had you know a fruit as a logo and sold the computer for I think six hundred and sixty six dollars just because that was you know the number of the devil. Um, you know, a couple of years later, IBM decided to join the game and make this respectable, right? So that businesses uh, across the U.S. and and maybe even even internationally would say like, okay. It's from IBM. I've bought my, you know, computing machines from IBM for years, right? Because they used to make these big mainframe computers before, so it must be good because it's from IBM. And so that's how we ended up with the IBM PC, which then, over the years, um, you know, became the de facto design of the industry standard um, PC. Now IBM would have loved to uh, be the only uh, company to make these PCs, but you know, the design was simple enough and used standard components um, that you could replicate and Microsoft Windows, uh, which is coming later, uh, would run on all of these. So IBM mostly helped making the PC respectable by, you know, sticking the IBM label on it. And technically there's not much of a difference between these two um, computers and what they're capable of doing. Uh, now, what were these computers capable of, of doing? What was introduced technically? Well, they had a, they were character terminals, right? There, so graphics was not immediately their their main idea. Uh, in fact, if you just bought these, you would basically just be mostly doing text-based user interfaces on this. But um, you know, if one of the things that IBM actually did introduce was the IBM Common User Access Guidelines (CUA), and they were actually um, a very early example of uh, a standardized uh, user interface design guideline. So it was telling you how to design your text user interfaces if you were following IBM's guidelines. The graphics were not standardized in, in, in any meaningful way at this, at this time, yet everybody was cooking their own thing. And here's a picture of, um, of seeing the um, uh, an early version of, um, of VisiCalc running. And uh, this actually looks probably more uh, familiar than, uh, than unfamiliar because it's, it's a spreadsheet, right? So uh, you'd have, um, you know, you enter your contents up here uh, and uh, then you can do things like computing, uh, adding up different uh, columns and rows. Every you know, cell has a row um, number and a column letter. So, you know, this is row whatever, B, B2, for example. Um, you know, the cursor is currently in this one here. Um, and you can use different uh, formatting options here for like, for example, with dollars and cents. Um, write justify, graph format, integer format, value. So it's all pretty much, this is actually from the, from the sort of, you know, uh, info, info suite. You can even do graphs on this thing by printing out asterisks, right, behind these uh, different numbers here. Um, you know, not, not very high end, but hey, this is uh, 1979, right? So um, this thing really um, changed, it was a game changer for, for lots of businesses. All right, um, so, after that, uh, we enter the realm of uh, bitmap GUIs and displays. So here, uh, we are uh, looking at um, the, you know, we, we've already seen a, a graphical display, right? Sketchpad was already looked like a graphical display. You were like, you know, drawing and stuff like this, but it was actually running on an oscilloscope, right? So the lines were being drawn one by one by a vector-based rendering engine that had a list of lines that it was drawing. Um, and every time the window was refreshed, it wasn't actually putting pixels on the screen. It was literally drawing lots of little lines. Um, so when the idea of bitmap displays and GUIs, uh, bitmap displays, came around, GUIs really took off. And the first system that did that was the Xerox Alto um, that was introduced by Park in 1973. This machine um, had a, a two and a half megabyte removable HD, which was before the floppy had been invented. Again, we're looking at you know, the 70s here, right? So no PCs yet. Um, about you know 128k of RAM, uh, a 600 by 800 display, a mouse, and an Ethernet. Uh, Ethernet got invented by Park as well as as part of their idea of creating the document environment of the future. Um, now, Park was a research lab and it still is a research lab. Uh, Park's a research lab in Palo Alto, Palo Alto Research Center, off Xerox. But Xerox mostly was a company that was of course known for its copiers, right? And it was um, you know this it was running this business this this, this research lab to, to make sure that they would stay in business sort of when, you know, photocopying wasn't going to be the biggest thing anymore. 
Um, as we can see here, uh, so par uh, out of park came some of the most uh, interesting inventions that we still use today, like Ethernet, for example. And as we can see here, uh, the, the Xerox Alto already um, had a mouse. It had also, you know, Doug Engelbart's cording keyword was being taken over here for the Alto. Um, that's the computer, that's the display unit. Interestingly, a portrait frame because Remember, document company, right? So we're looking at pieces of paper. So they were assuming that this should be uh, the best design for this. Um, uh, Park also, by the way, introduced other things like a laser printer came out of there. Wi-Fi was being uh, designed there. Uh, and for this time, this was a very astonishing uh, system. The resolution was something you know that was mind-boggling for the time. And actually, if you look at all these numbers, they all look ridiculous by today. Uh, the only one that hasn't gone up by like a factor of thousand uh, is is like you know the display resolution that hasn't gone up that much and it actually is only in recent years that we've even seen these um, retina level sort of you know resolutions that we talked about earlier. Um, the um uh, the editor running on the uh, on the system uh, was called Bravo. This was a WYSIWYG text editor, so a text editor that actually showed you your document, laid out the way that you would print it out later on your laser printer, um, and this whole system was written in Smalltalk. Um, Smalltalk being um, back then, you know, uh, one of the um, uh, you know, sort of in, envisioned languages of the future, fully object oriented, very powerful, very flexible. From today's point of view, a security nightmare because anybody could change anything in a small talk environment. But um, you know, those were the '70s, so um, things were a little more innocent back in that in the days. Um, in a way, you could say that this was the very first predecessor of an idea that Alan Kay, the father of uh, one of the you know uh, ad main advocates of. Um, uh, of small talk uh, and the father of the idea of the laptop. This was the first preview of what a laptop or an iPad uh, might later look like. And Park actually in 1973 coined the term personal computer. So that's where that word uh, comes from. Also, these interfaces ended up being known as um, Windows, icons, menus, and pointers, or WIMP interfaces. Um, so all these things were being introduced here, menus, uh, overlapping windows, pointing, dragging, all these things as we now know them, all these came out of uh, the Xerox Alto in 1973. But again, um, in a research lab, right, um, and this was not commercialized, um, it didn't actually um, reach the market. Right? And then something interesting happened, uh, you know, the Park Group, uh, the Park team that designed this, uh, took a look at this and said, we need to do better. And they took a long time to prove this and they ended up with a Xerox star in 1981. So that's eight years later. Um, and this was the first commercially available GUI computer. Notice I'm saying available, not commercially successful GUI computer, because it cost $17,000 at the time, which was a lot of money. Um, and uh, it had a few new change, uh, new things. Uh, one thing that was new was it was now a network document environment. Um, it had things like window management, property sheets, um, you know, full with WYSIWYG text editing, a whole intranet solution in it. Um, so it was built to improve the Alto um, and had a fairly unique design process. And I would say the thing that, apart from the whole windows, icons, menus, pointers, you know, metaphor, the, the desktop metaphor essentially being established right here in these two projects. Um, the interesting thing that we can also you know, take, take away from this was the design process because they, after you know, designing the first version of this, they really involved graphic designers heavily. And um, I've talked with some of these folks later on at, at, at Stanford and talked to them. Um, and they have actually been involved in you know, designing every single icon on the screen and testing them with users, trying to figure out if I want to show them that there's a document on this computer, what's the best icon to use? Like what should it look like? So they figured out uh, what kind of things to use there. And Bill Verplank, one of the designers of uh, this interface here actually a couple of years uh, ago visited us here in Aachen and gave a little class on, on sketching and user interfaces. Um, 
from a dimensional point of view, uh, these things were called by Nielsen 2.5D interfaces. Why 2.5D? Well, it's a 2D display. You can now do full screen interaction in two dimensions, but you can also overlap windows. Uh, so that's giving you an interesting um, view on, on the system beyond uh, what you would normally um, have on a, on a simple text-based interface like, uh, for example, the NLS where the windows were just tiled next to each other. All right, so uh, we're going to see a little video here of the uh, of the video uh, of the Xerox Star from 1981, um, and I'd like you to uh, uh, take a close look at um, especially how particular functions are being triggered because some of the keys uh, that the uh, the Star has have sort of curiously disappeared, and like, I'd like you to uh, tell us later where these keys went. The following videotape was made in 1982 by two Star designers. Enough? It okay. illustrates some of the innovations in computer-human interfaces embodied in the Xerox Star. I'm David Smith. I'd like to introduce you to the Xerox 8010 Star Information System. This is a new computer designed for office professionals. It consists of a processor, a large display screen, a keyboard, and a pointing device called the mouse. Stars are normally connected together by the Ethernet local area network. This not only allows stars to communicate with one another, but it also lets them share resources such as file storage and printers. The keyboard consists of a standard typing array and three groups of function keys. The left group contains the generic functions, delete, copy, move, and show properties. These four are used throughout the system. For example, you use the same function key, move, to move a character in text, a line in an illustration, a fraction in an equation, or a document in a file drawer. The top group of keys consists of common text formatting functions, making text bold, italic, underlined, super or subscripted, or in a larger or smaller font. The right group of keys consists of miscellaneous functions for getting online assistance, defining and expanding abbreviations, stopping ongoing operations, and others. The display screen shows your working environment. We call this the desktop. It is an electronic analog for an office. On the screens are small pictures or icons representing familiar office objects. This turned black because I pointed to it with the mouse and clicked the mouse button. We call this selecting the object. Selected objects highlight in reverse video. You can then operate on the selection with the delete, copy, move keys, and other keys. Let me select some of the other icons on the desktop. This is a folder, a records file, a file drawer, 3270 and teletype terminals, printers, and in and out mail baskets. Using the move key, you can arrange your desktop in any way you like. Move is the most powerful command in the system. It replaces a large number of conventional computer commands, which we will point out as we go along. The copy command is also a powerful one in STAR. It establishes a paradigm for creating. In order to create a new document, for example, you copy an existing one. Typically, STAR users construct blank documents to act as form pad sources for new ones. Making a copy of one of these blank documents is like tearing a sheet off a pad of paper. In addition to moving, copying, deleting, and showing properties, you can open an icon to see what's inside. You do this by selecting the icon and pushing the open key. The enlarged form is called the window. Every icon has its own window. This is a document window, displaying the contents of a document. Filing is done by moving an icon into or out of a file drawer. These are electronic analogs of the drawers in an office filing cabinet. File drawers are physically stored on file servers connected to the Ethernet. These 
are local ones stored on file servers in my building in Palo Alto. These are stored on file servers in Los Angeles. You can have as many or as few file drawers on your desktop as you want. Regardless of where they're stored, you interact with them in the same way. When you open a file drawer, it displays a filing window. Each object stored in the file drawer is represented by a miniature icon, a name, and some other information. The names need not be unique or even present. For example, there are two copies of the document named NCC script. The dates tell me which is the latest version. Filing is accomplished by editing filing windows. You can select an object with a mouse and move or copy it out to the desktop. Similarly, there is no print command. Printing is accomplished by moving an object to a printer icon. When you do this, a special window called an option sheet automatically appears. This is a dedicated form-like environment that is widely used in STAR to supply arguments to commands or to show properties of objects. Its virtue is that it makes all of the options visible. You don't have to remember what they are. In this case, you can specify the number of copies to print and whether you want the document repaginated before it is printed. Let's print this document and then walk over and pick up the output. As you can see, the screen closely approximates the appearance of a printed page. Mail is delivered to in-baskets. When you open an in-basket icon, a window appears which looks much like a filing window. The fields in the window are mailing related. The recipients of the mail, the date it was sent, who it was from, and the name of the item. Here is a piece of Japanese mail. Notice that any star document can be sent through the mail. On my desktop, I have a document named John's Report open. Like, like all icons, when they're open, they uh, occupy a portion of the screen called a window. And each window has a header with a title along the top and a few commands, usually toward the left end of it. Along the right edge of it is a vertical scrolling mechanism. And along the bottom is a horizontal scrolling mechanism. I'll do a little of that right now, just slide the image sideways, and then I'll put it back where it was. The vertical scrolling mechanism allows me to either change pages or slide the image up and down. What I'll do right now is simply flip to the next page. So this is page two of my document. And notice there's a heading up at the top of the page, and then a single column of text with a figure in the middle of it, and then more text below it. There's a little P up at the top of this, which lets me go to the previous page. So I'll simply do that and go back to the title page of this document, which is the first page, and then back to the second page again. So now we're back where we were. Uh, I can also slide the image up a little bit at a time, as I'm doing right now. And this allows me to see the boundaries between pages. So for example, here's the bottom of page two. And here's page two's page number the boundary between the pages, the heading for page three. And you'll notice that page three starts off in a two-column format. And there are mechanisms in STAR that allow you to change the number of columns on pages. In STAR, when you click the mouse button on the, over a character, then what happens is it highlights that particular character. And you'll see I can do that to any of several characters. If I click a second time on the same place, then it will select the word that contains that character. And if I click a third time, it selects the sentence that contains that word, and a fourth time selects the entire paragraph that contains that sentence. Now, paragraph is, in fact, what I wanted, so I'm simply going to hit the copy key, just as Dave was doing earlier. And I'm going to copy it into this upper document. And I do that by simply hitting copy key and selecting a paragraph in the upper document that I want it to follow. And the new paragraph will appear here. Now you notice, whereas in the old document, this paragraph occupied a single wide column, since this is a two-column page, it's automatically adjusted to be as narrow as it needs to be to fit into this column. But it hasn't picked up the inner line spacing of these other paragraphs. There's a key on the keyboard labeled same. And by simply pushing that and pointing to one of the paragraphs, I'd like it to be the same as. Then it simply changes the format 
of this paragraph. Okay, so now it's double space and, and all just as the other paragraph was. This is basically uh, an optimization form, a general mechanism called a property sheet. And if you notice down in the right hand corner of the screen now, this property sheet for this paragraph is appearing. This is a, a little window that lets me set the various parameters of a paragraph. So in fact, I can make it left flush centered or right flushed, or I can make it justified, and this one's currently justified, and that's indicated by a black highlighting. Now, these are what are called mutually exclusive choice parameters. If I pick one, the one, the current choice gets turned off. These down here are called state parameters. They're independent, so I could have it be bold and italic both, or even bold and italic and strike out. So let's just take a look at what this, how this appears now. So the text now is in 14 point bold, and it's also got what we call strikeout. In other words, a line through the middle of it. Now, text editing works just the same uh, as the move and copy paradigm that Dave was showing you before. I simply select, for example, a word and say move and point to a new place, and it moves that word down here. Or I might say copy and select another word, and it puts a copy of that word there. I can point at any place and start typing. And it simply goes in place, and all the paragraph stays justified as I type. This equation already partially exists, and what I'll do is add another term to it. And what I'm going to do to do that is to use what we call a virtual keyboard, which I'm going to cause to appear down at the bottom of the screen. Now, a virtual keyboard is basically a way of redefining the the meaning of each of the keys on the main typing array of the keyboard. And right now it's set to the English mode, and if I change it by pushing another key on the keyboard, then it takes on the meaning of the equation. So those are different symbols that I can put into equations, or some different mathematical symbols that I can use, or some logic symbols that I can use, or Greek characters, or some general purpose office symbols. I can also, uh, say, set it to French or German, or Spanish, or Italian, or in general, all of the accented characters on the European keyboards. OK, so uh, just real quick, anything you know is in there that, that looked different from what we're doing today? Was anything weird from today's point of view in the interactions? Yeah? They had like different, I guess, file storage systems? Thing going on, like there was a folder, there was something in the middle, and then there was even a drawer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we just have like multiple layers of folders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were visualizing the servers that, yeah, like remote storages, but it looked different from what we are used to uh, today. Right. Anything else? Yeah, back there. Yeah, yeah. So there were dedicated keys, right, for moving um, something around. You weren't just dragging it from A to B. Uh, you actually had to say, I want to move this and then and do the corresponding thing afterwards. Um, nevertheless, you may have noticed that, you know, he's going on like, oh, and we call this selecting an object. And like, all oh, like, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but this is, nobody had an idea that this was what you were doing. And it's actually a full 180 on the paradigm how you work. Because normally you type a command, and then the parameters, right? You say delete, blah, blah, right? And now with a graphical interface, if you do the same thing, if you say, I first pick the delete function and then select the object to delete, you're asking for trouble, right? Because you select the delete function first, then somebody calls you and you're like distracted, and then you come back to your computer, you click on something and suddenly you've deleted something. So you don't want that. That puts you into a mode, which you know about, that is very dangerous. So here we have a complete 180 on this. You first select objects and then you do something to it, which is much safer, right? Because I can select an object and only when I hit delete, I'm actually deleting it, right? So. Uh, that's something that was new to people, and that's why they were sharing this. Also, you may have noticed there was an inbox and an outbox on the desktop, right, for mail. This is an inter interesting integration of email functionality into uh, the desktop, which we 
we don't have in the same way today. Of course, the dedicated formatting keys are interesting, right? You know, bold uh, italics and so on. Again, you can see this was a document company, right? They were marketing this as something for the office that was creating documents and working with documents. Um, if the selecting once, two, twice, three times, four times seemed like something you know from Word, that's not an accident because Bravo, the text editor behind the Alto and the Star, actually turned into Word, right? So somebody told me um, that there is still some code in Word that will refer back to Bravo days these days. So it's all, you know, weirdly related. Um, you might also have noticed how slowly dialogues appeared, right? You know, it really took its time to build that dialogue. That's where you see Smalltalk was really fighting to keep up with the complexity of what it was asked to do on these very slow processors, right? So Smalltalk, not the cheapest environment, to run, right? It's object-oriented, full-blown. Um, it's not, you know, handcrafted assembler code or anything like that. And then you've got, like, you know, um, a slow 16-bit CPU that you're running, maybe a 68,000 or something like that. That's, you know, asking for uh, for trouble. Uh, and that was also one of the issues that, that uh, you know, these, uh, these devices had to fight with. Um, you may also have noticed the checkboxes and radio buttons looked actually different from what we know today, right? There was uh, a panel that said a couple of checkboxes, uh, which, you know, if you can check all of them, then they, uh, you can tell that because they are distanced from each other. Whereas if they are little boxes that are all connected, that means you can only select one of them. So different visual metaphor was being tried out to distinguish between you know, exclusive selection and multiple selection. Um, on the other hand, the virtual keyboard, uh, that looked pretty much like what I see on my Mac today when I open up the virtual keyboard, right? So um, it's interesting to see which things stuck around and which things changed uh, drastically. Uh, here's a quick uh, you know, view of the star keyboard, and as you can see, there's the dedicated buttons for like move, copy, etc. on there on the left. Today, we use keyboard shortcuts, right? Command X, Command V, etc. instead, uh, which uh, saves some extra hardware keys, but also means that it's a little bit harder to learn. And I know a lot of people who don't use them because they've never really cared about them. If the dedicated keys were in front of you, maybe you know, you'd be more tempted. Here's the formatting buttons I talked about. Here's my on the, on the right-hand side, we've got more buttons for doing certain things. Um, I like the repeat button and the undo button there. Uh, and my favorite was the big red stop button. I really wish they would bring that back to modern computers. Um, so uh, these are, I think, the most interesting ones to, to, to see here, what, what kind of options on there was uh, they, they, they selected. Um, here's the zoom in on that, on that right hand side. Um, especially, you can see an interesting mix of very text processing, word processing oriented things and general purpose computing. Yeah. I have a question, why yeah. did they have the same button? The same button, yeah. yeah, that would probably, I mean, I haven't used the system myself, but my guess is that it would probably copy the properties of something over to something else, which I use a lot, and I think I have to do like command option C and command option V on my computer. So I'm, I'm guessing that that is the idea of, you know, if I apply that paragraph. Like, you know, the paintbrush in, in Word, probably something along those lines. But uh, those buttons were being used across a variety of things, right? So you could use that to apply the same paragraph format to another paragraph, but probably also to apply, let's say, uh, the same color to a different object in a, in a painting app, right? So they were uh, using these buttons across the system. Now, um, there's one more thing that uh, has been written up nicely uh, on the star, and those were the lessons that the designers took out of developing this thing. They found that it was really necessary to first design and then code, which hadn't been a very well-known process until then, right? What we now know as the, you know, what you will get to know as the DIA cycle, sort of design, implement, analyze, and build your prototypes, and before you actually commit to coding something, uh, which is what this last, uh, the rest of the class will mostly be about, uh, that's something that was discovered during those times as the right way to go about building user-centered software and hardware. Um, they found, as I was mentioning, uh, the object action model, right? You know, select an object, issue an action on it, rather than the command line uh, sequence. And you still see that missed up sometimes today. I've got a, a PCB editing software for like printed circuit boards that actually behind the scenes is running a command line engine. And oftentimes the GUI actually reflects this command line structure. And it's 
super confusing when it's like you press a button and it actually starts a command and then you're supposed to select the options for it. It's like, what am I doing? It's very weird. Um, going into detail, like designing icons and, and really nailing down every single last pixel of the interface to get it just right was something that the star really taught, um, you know, the star team really learned from, from the process. Um, and um, Hiring graphic designers and involving them heavily in the design was also uh, a key thing in, in this thing. So this whole designing, implementing, analyzing, and then going back to the design stage, the cycle was essentially uh, unveiled during that time. And this will be the key topic of um, uh, the rest of this class. But we're not all using star computers today. You know, Xerox hasn't become, you know, um, Apple or Microsoft or anything like that. So what happened? Well, first of all, the industry trend was going somewhere else. While they were building a purely office-oriented document machine, um, everybody else was looking for a general purpose personal computer that would also do office work, but could also be used for other things. Um, their customer focus for that reason wasn't right, right? The industry was heading for the PC, um, and they didn't have their customers, um, you know, they didn't understand their customer base well enough um, to really nail the, the market, basically. Uh, it was also, this system was not designed to run any additional software. Right? This was designed to be a closed box like the computers before where end users don't install software, right? That's not what you do. Um, so the missing extensibility was, again, um, a nail in the coffin, I think, when you compare it especially to the things that were happening around the same time, right? The Apple II coming out and the IBM PC coming out which were all relying on third-party software to, to thrive. Um, and it was also slow, right? The responsiveness of the system was not good. Like I said, Smalltalk is a heavyweight language for a, for a pretty weak uh, processing environment here. Um, they also were hitting some limits with the metaphor. They were really clinging to the idea of bringing the paper-based desktop to the computer. And somewhere this was holding them back a little, I think. You could tell from some of the interactions, like the, you know, the inbox, outbox on the desktop and stuff like this, um, it was not quite... Um, they weren't quite ready to let go of this and, and make a more abstract new metaphor, uh, which of course I can understand because you want to get all the document workers that were working with typewriters and stuff, you want to get them on board for this product. But on the other hand, there's this much more wider base of users who don't want to do just office work with this thing, who need a more general purpose user interface, right? They need a more general purpose finder, desktop, explorer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and finally, also, um, Park just wasn't good at, at selling radical innovation. And in general, it's hard to sell radical innovation. Selling something that is very different from what everybody else has been doing so far often fails the first time around, right? The, you need to get sort of the public ready for understanding that this is actually what makes sense and that they should adopt it. Um, it was, this was very different from what people had seen so far, and therefore it didn't quite sell yet. Um, Steve Jobs visited Park in 1979 uh, uh, and was immediately intrigued, of course. So, um, you know, what Park was doing, the, um, this was in 79 before the star had been released. So he saw mostly the Alto and that definitely ca caught his eye. Um, so as a result, Apple built uh, uh, their own first bitmap GUI computer called the Apple Lisa, uh, inspired by the Alto, not the Star, uh, which you can tell, among other things, it has a one-button mouse, uh, which is fairly simplistic. Um, and uh, the, this device uh, had a couple key advances. One of the things that Apple changed uh, compared to the Alto design was that they used a fixed menu bar. Uh, instead of the pop-up menus, right? Uh, the Alto was relying heavily on menus appearing on different pages, uh, places, and um, Apple said, no, we want a fixed menu bar for two major reasons. One is that means that people always know where to find the commands and they are not hidden because the pop-up menu is invisible, right? Until you know that you need to press a button to make it appear. Uh, and the second thing, of course, as you know by now, is Fitz Law, right? You know, the, a, a menu bar at the top is just incredibly fast to, to reach. Um, but the problem with the Lisa was that um, 
even though it was um, you know, a nice adoption and, and, and evolution of what the uh, Alto was doing, it was underpowered and the marketing also wasn't great. It was still a $10,000 machine at the time. And, and you just said you converted the $17,000 of the Alto into today's money and it's like 50, 60,000. Yeah, fifty-six thousand dollars. Yeah, so you can see how you know we're we're asking people to buy like you know uh, a fairly expensive car essentially um, to to get one of these computers and um, the. Uh, uh, the, the, the the Lisa is sort of you know ended up ha it, you know the knock knock jokes does it make any sense you know knock knock jokes people tell the you know part of it the, and there was a joke going around at the time it was like knock knock and and they said who's there Lisa because it was because it was so slow in in responding to any of your inputs um, the last Lisas actually were buried literally in a landfill in Utah in 1989 for a tax write-off from Apple um, so if you want to go and dig for some Lisas uh, you know, knock yourselves out um, it was also you know so in the end it was not a commercially successful computer uh, yet the user interface um, you can tell it looks quite familiar already, right? You've got overlapping windows. As you can see here, uh, you've got a menu bar at the top, right? That's, that's known. Uh, you've got scroll bars on the right and then the bottom, and that made it right to the Mac. Um, and this is actually running um, um, an early version of a paint program, um, which ended up being Mac Paint uh, later on then, um, a bitmap drawing um, application. So um, remember the long nose I talked about, right? Um, the long nose of innovation. I want to show you one more example of how that long nose applies. Um, in 2011, uh, there was a, uh, an introduction by Apple of a feature they called autosave um, and that worked in quite a clever way. You know, Mac OS has this like time machine backup system behind the scenes that's always available and always running and very user friendly. And they extended that to basically get rid of the need to save your documents. And here's a short clip from that presentation. One of the most fundamental changes is also one of the simplest, saving your files. Now, with Autosave and Lion, you don't have to worry about saving anymore. While you work, Versions takes a virtual snapshot every step of the way, so you can always refer back to your earlier work. Okay, that sounds pretty good, right? That's an improvement because before that, it wasn't there. You, you remember, we, we're all probably still have ingrained, like, if I want to be safe, I save often, right? You hit Command S or whatever you do on your computer uh, regularly just to, you know, as a, as a parano out of paranoia. And Apple got rid of that. It said, like, we're going to do that for you, um, and you only need to save when you really want a new version. When you really want to mark, it's like, this is sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that section of the text. I want to be able to go back to precisely that version uh, under a named uh, uh, configuration, then you do autosave. Now let's go back to a presentation that one of the original designers of the Lisa was giving. Many years later, uh, you will hear the audience laughing about like that his system clock is like 20 years in the past. Um, but he's talking about a feature in Lisa. <laughs> You could say revert to previous version. I'd, I'll probably be able to do this anyway. And so what you could do is you could remove all the changes you made since you last saved the document. Now the system was designed to be robust. The applications periodically put out uh, this edits file. Kind of an autosave, but it didn't overwrite your existing save document. When the system was turned off or when a diskette was ejected, excuse me, the document was suspended. Here I'm going to do undo the changes, revert. <laughs> it's been a while since I've used this, but it really is my system. And by the way, it was really 10 years ago. The Lisa clock stopped turning over in 1995. <laughs> we don't have a year 2000 problem. <laughs> So the idea here was that save was something you did when you wanted to because you had made a set of changes to a document that brought it up into a new consistent state. The only time, that was the only time you ever might have wanted to save, and it was actually never, you never actually had to save if you didn't want to, but then you couldn't revert. You did not have to save because you were paranoid. You did not have to save because you removed the diskette. You did not have to save because you turned the system off. That made revert 
useful because the last safe version was a, was, a, was a version which you thought was consistent. Essentially, we had kept two versions of the document, the current working version and the saved one. And had we had time, we probably would have added a, a real versioning system that would kept them, keep them later. Now, where was, where was that suspend file? Well, it turns out that the icons on the desktop are not desk, disk files. The icon on the desktop is an object, and behind it may be 0, 1, 2, 3, and disk files. The user never dealt with disk files directly. What this did was it kept down the number of icons on the desktop. There wasn't a second uh, icon for the suspend file. There was not a second icon for perhaps a lock file or something of that nature. The Lisa list program kept an, uh, a disk file for each index into this flat file that it managed. You only saw one icon and you only dealt with one icon. And when you transferred something to another place, everything worked. Uh, you never had a chance of corrupting the object by accidentally removing or losing one of the disk files because of something you did accidentally. All right. You're doing so uh, as you can see, you know that's autosave in a really useful, semantically you know meaningful way um, in Lisa's uh, OS in sort of the um, early 80s, uh, and uh, it's coming back you know in, in 2011 as sort of the, the latest and greatest invention. Uh, another good example, I think, of ideas having to sometimes just resurface um, to be applicable again. All right, um, so. What this means is basically that history, this is another example of why history matters, right? You know, uh, we can see that relaunching an application uh, to, to bring back sort of the, the last state and only saving explicitly for checkpoints is something that um, you, know, you really want to have and uh, we've seen it sort of come back uh, and history tends to repeat itself. Now, uh, let's move on. Um, uh, oh, oh, by the way, I should also say uh, that that autosave is not in, 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 in the Xerox star. It's, uh, it's something that the Lisa sort of added uh, initially. Now we're going to move on to uh, uh, Apple's Big Coup, um, which of course uh, was based on this uh, um, advertisement video here. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information in all history, a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests of very contradictory views. Communication as a horse is more powerful a weapon than any fleet or army on earth. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves to death, and we will on January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see 